Hi guys, Thumper here with another Liberation tutorial. Today, we're going to be talking about the settings that Liberation has to offer. Now look, Liberation has a lot of settings, and most of them are pretty self-explanatory. They pretty much do what they say they do. So I'm not going to sit here and tediously go through and talk about every single one, but I am going to talk about some of the ones that I find the most helpful, the most useful when I'm setting up a campaign, and some of the ones that might need a little more context behind them. Also, hey, uh, I use the term performance boost a lot in this video. DCS is a game that is unfortunately really unoptimized, so the more units that are in the game, the worse frames you get while you're flying around. So something to keep in mind because I talk about it a lot as I get to performance settings. Anytime we want to start a new campaign in Liberation, we're going to come up here and hit this new game button. When we do, we'll be presented with a new game wizard. And this is where we're going to run into the first real settings we're going to find. Uh, we have a list of campaigns and every single one of them has a completely different layout. Um, and if you want to just test the layouts and see which ones you like, the easiest thing to do is just going to be to, you know, click one and then hit next, 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 and finish. Just leave it all default. And then you can just get a feel for what the layout's going to look like without actually, you know, setting up the campaign. Because it can really suck when you go and set up the campaign and then you don't like the layout and you go through all of those screens and set everything up tediously just to find out that you you don't actually like the layout that you came up with. Now, generally on any of these campaign layouts, uh, they're going to be the same with respect that like SAM sites are always going to be where SAM sites are. Uh, and then like armor will always be where armor is. Now, the thing that might change is these SAM sites could be something different if we roll up the same campaign again. So like there's an SA2 here now. Uh, if I was to pull up the same campaign a second time, and now this time around, there's an SA3 here. So the layout changes slightly. Uh, the locations remain the same. It's just a matter of different units can go in those places. Another setting that might interest you is the invert map settings. Uh, not all of the campaigns support this, so you kind of have to test, but it does exactly what you think. It just flips the sides so that you spawn where the enemy normally would. The time period can basically just have an effect on your weather. Uh, so if you choose summer, you know, it's going to be mostly clear. And then if you choose winter, there will be snow on the ground, so on and so forth. Springtime, probably a bit more rain. Uh, I generally just go with, you know, whatever the actual real day I'm starting the campaign is, and I'll click it. There is a bunch of different factions you can choose from as your player faction and as your enemy faction, and below shows all of the units that are available to that given faction. Uh, if you're looking for something that's just modern, if you just want kind of modern that includes most of the flyable aircraft in DCS, just go with the uh, blue four modern, and then as an enemy, you can do like red four Russia. These are both basically going to include most of what you would expect to see in a blue and a red faction. One setting that can cause you a bit of grief is the desired mission duration. Uh, we can set this from as low as 30 minutes up to 150 minutes. Now keep in mind, this is a desired mission duration. Uh, this doesn't actually mean that everything is going to happen perfectly within, let's say, a 60-minute window, okay? Uh, a lot of times, the AI can have a habit of backloading a lot of its flights. So you might say, I do 60 minutes. It might schedule a lot of its flights to go out for like 50 minutes time on target. However, the way the AI works, sometimes those time on targets get off and then you go you know, well into, you know, 80 minutes, 90 minutes before those packages are actually arriving. So if you just want things to actually be on target, I would go with kind of a higher 
number here. I generally go with about two hours, and that seems to work pretty well, pretty reliably for me. Uh, when it comes to economy options, you have to be kind of careful with these. If you crank budgets up really, really high, it can result in the campaign manager purchasing lots and lots of units, especially on some of the larger campaigns. Now, if they do that, it can cause you know pretty significant performance drops that can affect you pretty negatively. So I generally just kind of have been leaving these default and you know playing with these as needed. On this screen, we have the available plugins for Liberation. So CTLD has to do with transport and logistics. Uh, this is basically what allows you to pick up crates and other such items in a helicopter and carry them from place to place. I don't use this. I don't fly helicopters for this purpose ever, but it's cool that it's there if you need it. Here is Skynet IADS. If you don't know what Skynet IADS is, it's basically just the program that makes the SAMs behave like SAM sites. So, meaning they will turn themselves off to prevent themselves from getting hit by harms. Now, if you and other players are performing the seed in your campaign, then it's a great feature. It just makes things a little bit harder, makes things a little bit more fun for you, a little bit more of a challenge. However, if you're going to have AI performing most of your seed duties, you're going to want to toggle this Skynet IADS off because AI and Skynet IADS do not go well together. It will just basically bug out. Down here we have splash damage, and you should probably enable it. If you're going to be dropping bombs of any kind, it is super helpful with making the bombs just behave more like actual bombs. And down here we have lot ATC export. Uh, if you know what lot ATC export is, then you probably know whether or not you need it. Whenever we click finish, we're going to be presented with the squadron configuration screen. Now, this is going to get its own video where I'm going to talk about it more in depth. But for now, we're just going to take the settings as is and hit accept. Anytime you drop into a new game, the first thing you should do is make a save file for whatever game you're planning on running. And then you should immediately go up here and click the settings. And there's even more stuff that we get presented with that we can modify for our campaign. For coalition skills, I would recommend going for high. I personally would avoid excellent. The reason is that sometimes AI performs absolute miracles, like avoiding missiles without deploying any chaff at all from very small ranges, uh, just because they're set on the excellent settings. So I find that typically high makes them behave a bit more like people and not completely crazy. Here we have man pads on front lines. This can help your performance if you toggle it off. But if you're going to be running a lot of like cast missions on the front line, then you know you should keep it on. It's just more fun, more challenging. Right underneath that, we have mission restrictions. I always toggle off my in-game labels and I toggle off my battle damage assessment because I don't like aids on the screen. I like for things to be even harder. On the next tab down, we have campaign management, and personally, I do not adjust any of this. Uh, the top general section is things that are work in progress or depreciated. Uh, the second section is for squadrons and pilot leveling. Uh, I suspect if you really want to get super realistic and anal about how pilots are replenished, this is probably a great way to do it, but I personally don't use this feature. And then HQ automation, I don't have anything here that I need to change. On the next tab down, we have the mission generator settings. Uh, this is where most of the settings that are relevant to me exist. Uh, we have battlefield commanders, so we can toggle on game masters, tactical commanders, JTAC operators, and observer slots. Uh, tactical commander is what allows you to command units, kind of like an RTS in the F10 menu. Um, if you have combined arms and then the game master is the same thing, except he can do it for both sides. So if you have somebody that wants to like role play as the enemy, 
they can jump into the game master slot and do that. As we move on down, uh, we hit player missions interrupt fast forward. I set this to at startup time. This just makes it so the mission begins exactly when it says up here. Further down, we have a setting for player flights ignore time on target and spawn immediately. If you don't have this toggled on and you try to get in your jet before the game thinks it's time for you to get in your jet, it'll bug out and you'll despawn and it'll be a bad time. So toggle it on and you won't be disappointed. Right under that, we have default start type for AI aircraft. And under this, we have four different options. I personally only ever use cold or in flight. Both come with advantages and disadvantages. Hey guys, Future Thumper here. When I originally recorded this, I droned on for like a really long time about this. Basically, cold start is good for immersion. If you want to hear aircraft's engines start up and see aircraft taxiing around the airfield around you, that can be a cool option. It is, however, bad for a few reasons. One, it can pretty negatively affect your performance. Two, uh, AI can bug out really bad when trying to taxi and screw up everything and stop all traffic at the airfield. And three, most importantly, most of the time, the AI just has trouble taxiing efficiently. So your time on targets will get all off throughout the entire mission. A good reason to use the in-flight start is because it fixes all of those other problems if you can deal with not having a lot of aircraft around you at the airfield. As we move down, we have a whole bunch of performance settings. There is a lot here, and you can adjust these settings to find out what works well for you and what affects you the most. One of the biggest settings here is culling of distant units enabled. When a unit is culled, it just means it is not spawned in. So this can help your performance pretty significantly by reducing the number of units that's actually on the battlefield on any given liberation turn. I'm going to show you how culling works, but if you just want some quick results, uh, toggle this checkbox and dial this down to like 50 or less, and you'll get some pretty significant performance boosts immediately. Now to actually see culling zones in action, we'll come out of here and we'll click right here and go down to culling exclusion zones and boom, we'll have a bunch of green rings. Now, what this is saying is that everything, all ground units inside of these rings will spawn in. All ground units outside of the green will not spawn in. That includes yours and the enemies. Aircraft are never cold, so aircraft will always spawn into the game. The other thing that pretty much always happens is the front line and the two control points that connect the front line will be assigned culling exclusion zones. So why would you want to use this? Well, most of the time, like say on this campaign, uh, I'm mostly going to be attacking this airfield and then slowly moving the ground forces forward. Uh, so I'm not necessarily concerned with all this stuff that's back here. So the game doesn't need to spawn it in which is why I get such a significant performance boost while having culling settings turned on. Now, this, this is a setting that allows you to kind of cheese things. So, uh, like right here, we can see that, you know, there's SA-10 coverage. There's a ring from an SA-10 right here. However, this SA-10 isn't going to spawn in on this turn, so I'm not actually threatened by that SA-10 at all. Um, now, on a different turn, where this is included in one of the exclusion zones, uh, things might be different. But it's just something where you have to kind of keep in mind what you're challenging yourself with and just keep an eye on things so you can figure out what you want to present yourself with. The gains that you get from having culling settings on are incredibly valuable. And lastly, we have the cheat menu. Uh, underneath cheat settings, we have show red ATO, enable frontline cheats, and enable base capture cheats. 
I do generally just enable these. Now, if we want to see these, we can click on, say, if I click on Sochi Adler, now I can see this cheat capture. And if I click it, it does exactly that, captures it. Well, now my front line is moved up to here on the other side of Sochi Adler. So if I click on this and go to the ground forces tab, now I can see a cheat for advance. And it moves the front line up. These cheats generally, I don't touch them if I don't need to, but they can be really helpful on turns where you're just flying and waiting for ground units to push up and make a capture. Like turns where you know this is going to happen and there's nothing they can really do about it. It helps to just kind of, you know, skip that and not have to fly all of those turns. So just keep in mind that that option is there if you need it. That's all the settings that I personally use and I put a lot of my focus on. Best thing to do is honestly just, you know, play with it. Play with the settings, find out what works for you. But those are the ones that I find the most helpful. And hopefully, if you're just playing around with DCS for the first time, you can find them helpful too. If you like the video, then like and subscribe, and I will see you on the next Liberation Tutorial.